So with that, I'm going to take some questions. And because uh, Josh Ernest uh, has some pull around here, he just happened to put at the top of the list, uh, top of the list, uh, Colleen Nelson of the Wall Street Journal. My understanding is, Colleen, that this is. Uh, wrapping up your stint here, and you were going to Kansas City. Yeah. Josh just happens to be from Kansas City. <laughs> so I didn't know if there was any coincidence there, but uh, we, uh, we wish you the very best of luck in your new endeavors. As it turns out, there's no place like that. There you go. Um, you're about to embark on your final foreign trip. What will you say to other world leaders about your successor? Uh, they've expressed many of the same misgivings that you have about Donald Trump. Should they be worried about the future of U.S. foreign policy? And separately, as Democrats scramble to regroup uh, after a pretty shocking upset, uh, what is your advice about where the party goes now and, and who should lead your party? One of the great things about uh, the United States is that when it comes to world affairs, the president obviously is the leader of the executive branch, the commander-in-chief, uh, the spokesperson for the nation. But the influence and the work that we have is the result not just of the president. It is the result of countless interactions and arrangements and relationships between our military and other militaries and our diplomats and other diplomats and intelligence officers. and. Uh, development workers. And there is enormous continuity uh, beneath the day-to-day -day news uh, that makes us uh, that indispensable nation when it comes to maintaining order and uh, promoting prosperity around the world. That will continue. Uh, in my conversation with the President-elect, uh, he uh, expressed a, a great interest in maintaining our core strategic relationships. Uh, and so one of the messages I will be able to deliver is his commitment to NATO and the Transatlantic Alliance. Uh, I think that's one of the most important functions I can serve at this stage during this trip, uh, is to let them know that uh, there is no weakening of resolve when it comes to America's commitment to maintaining a strong and robust uh, NATO relationship and a recognition that those alliances uh, uh, aren't just good for Europe, they're good for the United States, uh, and they're vital for the world. With respect to the Democratic Party, um, look, as I said in the Rose Garden right after the election, when your team loses, everybody gets deflated, and uh, it's hard, and it's challenging. Um, and so I think it's a healthy thing for the Democratic Party to go through uh, some reflection. Um, you know, I think it's important for me not to be bigfooting that conversation. I think we want to see new voices and new ideas emerge. That's part of the reason why uh, I think term limits are a really useful thing. Um, I think the Democrats should not waver on our core beliefs and principles. Uh, the belief that we should have an economy that works for everybody, not just a few. The belief that America, at its best, is inclusive and not exclusive. That we insist on the dignity and God-given potential and worth of every child regardless of race or gender or sexual orientation or what zip code they were born in, uh, that we are committed to uh, a world in which we keep America safe, but uh, we recognize that uh, our power doesn't just flow from our extraordinary military, it also flows from the strength of our ideals and our principles uh, and our values. So there are going to be a, a, a core set of values that um, shouldn't be up for debate, should be our North Star. Uh, but how we organize politically, uh, I think, is something that uh, we should spend some time thinking about. Um, I believe that we have better ideas. But I also believe 
that good ideas don't matter if people don't hear them. And one of the issues that Democrats have to be clear on is that given population distribution across the country, um, we have to compete everywhere. We have to show up everywhere. Uh, we have to work at a grassroots level, something that's been a running thread in my career. Um, you know, I won Iowa not because the demographics dictated that I would win Iowa. It was because I spent 87 days going to every small town and fair and fish fry and DFW Hall. And there were some counties where I might have lost, but maybe I lost by 20 points instead of 50 points. There's some counties maybe I won that people didn't expect because people had a chance to see you and listen to you and get a sense of who you stood for and who you were fighting for. And the challenge for a national party is how do you dig in there and uh, create those kinds of structures so that people have a sense of what it is that you stand for. Uh, and, and, and that increasingly is difficult to do just through a national press strategy. Uh, it's increasingly difficult to do because of the splintering of the press. Uh, and so um, I think the discussions that have been taking place about how do you build more grassroots organizing, how do you build up state parties and local parties and school board elections you're paying attention to and state rep races and city council races, that all uh, I think will contribute to uh, stronger outcomes in the future. Um, and I'm optimistic that will happen. You know, I, for, for Democrats who are feeling completely discouraged, uh, I've been trying to remind them, uh, everybody remembers my Boston speech in 2004. They may not remember me showing up here in 2005 when John Kerry had lost a close election. Tom Daschle, the leader of the Senate, had been beaten in an upset. Ken Salazar and I were the only two Democrats that won nationally. Uh, Republicans controlled the Senate and the House. And two years later, uh, Democrats were winning back Congress, and four years later I was President of the United States. Things change pretty rapidly. Uh, but it does, they don't change inevitably. They change because you work for it. Uh, nobody said democracy is supposed to be easy. It's hard. And uh, in a big country like this, it probably should be hard. Mark Noller. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> Mr. President, what can you tell us about the learning curve on becoming president? Is, can you tell us how long it took you before you were fully at ease in the job, if that ever happened? And did you discuss this matter with uh, President-elect Trump? About a week ago, I started feeling pretty good, but uh, <laughs> no. I, look, I, the, uh, I think the lear learning curve always uh, continues. Uh, this is a remarkable job. It is like no other job on Earth. And it is a constant flow of information and challenges and issues. That is truer now than it has ever been, partly because of the nature of information and the interconnection uh, between uh, regions of the world. Uh, you know, if, you, if you were president 50 years ago, the tragedy in Syria might not even penetrate what uh, the American people were thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, they're seeing vivid images of a child uh, in the aftermath of a bombing. Uh, there was a time when, if you had a financial crisis in Southeast Asia somewhere, it had no impact on our markets. Today, it does. So uh, the amount of information, the amount of uh, incoming 
that any administration has to deal with today and respond to much more rapidly than ever before, uh, that makes a difference. Uh, I was watching a documentary that uh, during the Bay of Pigs crisis, uh, JFK had about two weeks before anybody reported on it. Imagine that. Uh, I think it's fair to say that if something like that happens under a current president, uh, they got to figure out in about an hour uh, what their response is. So uh, these are the kinds of uh, points that I shared with the president-elect. Um, it was a, uh, a free-flowing and uh, I think useful conversation. I hope it was. Uh, I tried to be as honest I, as I could about uh, the things I think any president coming in needs to think about. Um, and probably the most important point that I made was that uh, how you staff, particularly your chief of staff, your national security advisor, your White House counsel, um, you know, how you set up a process and a system to, to surface information, generate options for a president, understanding that ultimately the president's going to be the final decision maker, uh, that that's something that has to be attended to right away. Uh, I have been blessed by having, and I admittedly am biased, uh, some of the smartest, hardest working, good people uh, in my administration that uh, I think any president's ever had. And as a consequence of that team, uh, I've been able to make good decisions. Um, and if you, if you don't have that around you, uh, then you'll get swamped. So uh, I, I hope that he appreciated uh, that advice. What I also discussed was the fact that uh, I had been encouraged by his statements on election night about the need for uh, unity and uh, his interest in being the president for all people. And that how he staffs, the, the first steps he takes, the first impressions he makes, uh, the reset that can happen after an election, uh, all those things are important and should be thought about. Uh, and I think it's important to give him the room and the space to do that. It takes time uh, to put that together. Um, but I emphasize to him that Look, in an in a election like this that was so hotly contested and so divided, uh, gestures matter. Uh, and how he uh, reaches out to groups that may not have supported him, uh, how he uh, signals his interest uh, in their issues or concerns, uh, I think those are the kinds of th uh, things that can set a tone that will uh, will help move things forward uh, uh, once he's actually taken office. And how long did it take before you were at ease in the job? Well, I didn't really have time to worry about being at ease because you'll recall we were losing about 800,000 jobs a month. So uh, I, the good news is that in some ways my experience is atypical. Uh, it's hard to find an analogous situation. By the time FDR came into office, the Depression had been going on for a couple of years. Uh, we were in the midst of a free fall. Financial system was locking up. The auto industry was about to go belly up. Uh, the housing market had entirely collapsed. Um, so uh, you know, one of the advantages that I had was that I was too busy uh, to worry about how acclimated I was feeling in the job. Uh, we just had to make a bunch of decisions. Uh, in this situation, uh, we're turning over a country that has challenges, has problems, and obviously uh, there are people out there who are feeling deeply disaffected. Otherwise, we wouldn't have uh, had the results that we had in the election. On the other hand, if you look at um, the basic indicators of uh, where the country is right now, the unemployment rate is as low as it's been in eight, nine years. Incomes and wages have both gone up over the last year faster than they have uh, in a decade or two. Uh, we've got historically low uninsured rates. 
the financial systems are stable. The stock market is uh, hovering around its all-time high, and 401ks have been restored. The housing market has recovered. Uh, we have challenges internationally, but uh, our most immediate challenge with respect to ISIL, uh, we're seeing significant progress in Iraq, uh, and Mosul uh, is now uh, increasingly uh, being uh, retaken by Iraqi security forces, supported by us. Uh, our alliances are in strong shape. Uh, our, the progress we've made with respect to carbon emissions uh, has been greater than any country on Earth. And bu uh, gas is two bucks a gallon. So uh, he will have time and space, I think, to make uh, judicious decisions. Uh, the incoming administration doesn't have to uh, put out a huge number of fires. They may want to take the country in a significantly di uh, different direction. But they've got time to consider what exactly uh, they want to achieve. And uh, that's a testament to the tremendous work that my team's done over the last eight years. I'm very proud of them for it. Athena Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you said more than once that you did not believe that Donald Trump would ever be elected president and that you thought he was unfit for the office. Now that you've spent time with him, sitting down and talking to him for an hour and a half in the Oval Office, do you now think uh, that President-elect Trump is qualified uh, to be president? And if I can do a compound question, the other one is you mentioned staffing and tone. What do you say to those Americans who may not doubt that there will be a peaceful transition, but that are concerned about some of the policies and sentiments either expressed by uh, President-elect Trump himself or his supporters that may seem hostile to minorities and others. Specifically, I'm talking about the announcement that Steve Bannon, who is a proponent of the so-called alt-right movement, what many call the white nationalist movement, is going to have a prominent role in the White House under uh, President Trump as his chief strategist and senior advisor. What message does that send to the country and to the world? Okay. Uh, Athena, without copping out, I think it's fair to say that it would not be appropriate for me to comment on every appointment that uh, the President-elect starts making um, if I want to be consistent with the notion that we're going to try to facilitate a smooth transition. Look, uh, the people have spoken. Donald Trump will be the next President, the 45th President of the United States. And it will be up to him to set up a team that he thinks will serve him well and reflect his policies. And uh, those who didn't vote for him have to recognize that that's how democracy works. That's how uh, this system operates. When I won, there were a number of people who didn't like me and didn't like what I stood for. And uh, you know, I think that whenever you've got uh, an incoming president of the other side, particularly in a bitter election like this, um, it takes a while for people to uh, reconcile themselves with that new reality. Hopefully it's a reminder that elections matter and voting counts. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how many times we have to relearn this lesson because we ended up having 43% uh, of the country not voting who were eligible to vote, but it makes a difference. Um, so uh, given that President-elect Trump uh, is now trying to balance what he said in the campaign and the commitments he made to his supporters with working with uh, those who disagreed with him and members of Congress and uh, reaching out to constituencies that didn't vote for him. Uh, I think it's important for us to let him make his decisions. Uh, and I think the American people will judge over the course of the next couple of years whether um, they like what they see and whether uh, these are the kinds of policies uh, and this is the direction that they want to see the country going. Um, 
and, and my role is to make sure that uh, when I hand off this uh, White House, that it is in the best possible shape and that I've been as helpful as I can to him in going forward and building on the progress that we've made. Um, you know, and, and my advice, as I said to, to uh, the President-elect when we had our discussions, uh, was that campaigning is different from governing. I think he recognizes that. Uh, I think he's sincere in wanting to be a successful president uh, and uh, moving this country forward. And I don't think any president ever comes in saying to himself, uh, I want to figure out how to make people angry or alienate half of the country. Uh, I think he's going to try uh, as best he can to, to make sure that uh, he delivers, not only for the people who voted for him, but for the people at large. And the good thing is, is that there are going to be elections coming up, so there's a built-in incentive for him to try to do that. Uh, but, um, you know, it's only been six days, and I think it will be important for him to, uh, to, to have the room to staff up, uh, to figure out what his priorities are, to, to be able to distinguish between what he was campaigning on and what is practical, what he can actually achieve. Uh, you know, there are certain things that make for good sound bites but don't always translate into good policy. Uh, and uh, you know, that's something that he and his team, I think, will wrestle with in the same way that every president wrestles with. Um, I did say to him, as I've said publicly, um, that because of the nature of the campaigns uh, and the bitterness and, and ferocity of the campaigns, that it's really important to try to send some signals uh, of unity and to reach out uh, to minority groups or women or others that were uh, concerned about uh, the tenor of the campaign. And I think you know, that's something that he will, uh, will want to do. Um, but this is all happening real fast. Uh, he's got commitments to supporters that help to get him here, and he's going to have to balance those. Uh, and uh, you know, over, the, over the coming weeks and months uh, and years, uh, my hope is, is that those impulses uh, ultimately went out. But it's a little too early to start uh, making judgments on that. You have like qualifications. Has that changed after meeting with him? You know, I think that uh, he successfully mobilized a big chunk of the country to vote for him, and he's going to win. He has won. He's going to be the next president. Uh, and uh, regardless of what experience or assumptions he brought to the office, uh, this office has a way of waking you up, and uh, those uh, those aspects of um, uh, his positions or predispositions that don't match up with reality, uh, uh, he will uh, find shaken up pretty quick because. Reality has a way of asserting itself. Um, and some of his gifts that obviously allowed him to um, execute one of the biggest political upsets in history, um, you know, those are ones that hopefully uh, he will put to good use uh, on behalf of all the American people. Scott Horsley. Thank you, Mr. President. You're off to Europe, which is facing some of the same populist pressures we see at work in this country. Uh, when you spoke at the UN, you talked about the choice they're facing between integration and building walls. Right. What choice do you think the American people made last week? And is there still a chance for what you call a course correction before Europeans make some of their choices? I think the American people 
recognize that the world has shrunk, that it's interconnected, that you're not going to put that genie back in the bottle. The American people recognize that their careers or their kids' careers are going to have to be more dynamic, that they might not be working at a single plant for 30 years, but they might have to change careers. They might have to get uh, more education. They might have to uh, retool or retrain. Uh, and I think the American people are game for that. They want to make sure that the rules of the game are fair. And what that means is that uh, if if you look at surveys around uh, Americans' attitudes on trade, the majority of the American people still support trade. But they're concerned about whether or not trade is fair and whether we've got the same access to other countries' markets as they have with us. Is there just a race to the bottom when it comes to wages and so forth? Now, I made an argument. Uh, thus far unsuccessfully that the trade deal we had organized, TPP, uh, did exactly that, that it strengthened workers' rights and environmental rights, leveled the playing field, and as a consequence would be good for American workers and American businesses. Um, but that's a, a complex argument to make when people remember plants closing and jobs uh, being offshore. So part of what I think this election reflected was people wanting that course correction that you described and the, the message around stopping surges of immigration, uh, not creating new trade deals that may be unfair. Uh, I think those were themes that uh, played a prominent role in the campaign. As we now shift to governing, my argument is that uh, we do need to make sure that we have an orderly, lawful immigration process, but that if it is orderly and lawful, immigration is good for our economy. It keeps this country young. It keeps it dynamic. We have entrepreneurs and strivers who come here and are willing to take risks. and. Uh, that's part of the reason why uh, America historically has been successful. It's part of the reason why our economy is stronger and better positioned than most of our other uh, competitors is because we've got a younger population that's more dynamic. Um, when it comes to trade, I think you know, when you're governing, it'll become increasingly apparent that if you were to just eliminate trade deals uh, with Mexico, for example, well, you've got a global supply chain. The parts that are allowing uh, auto plants that were about to shut down to now employ double shifts is because they're bringing in some of those parts uh, to assemble out of Mexico. And so it's not as simple as it might have seemed. Uh, and, and, you know, the key for us when I say us, I mean Americans, but I think particularly for progressives, uh, is to say uh, your concerns are real, your anxieties are real. Here's how we fix them. Higher minimum wage, stronger uh, worker protection so workers have more leverage to get a bigger piece of the pie. Stronger financial re regulations, not weaker ones. Yes to trade, but trade that ensures that these other countries that trade with us aren't engaging in child labor, for example. Um, being attentive to inequality uh, and not tone deaf to it, uh, but offering prescriptions that are actually going to help folks uh, uh, in communities that feel forgotten. That's going to be uh, our most important strategy. And, uh, and I think we can successfully do that. People will still be looking to the United States. Uh, our example will uh, still carry great weight. Um, 
And it uh, continues to be my strong belief that the way we are going to make sure that everybody feels a part of this global economy is not by shutting ourselves off from each other, even if we could, but rather by working together more effectively than we have in the past. Martha Raddatz. Thanks, Mr. President. Given some of the harsh words you had about Mr. Trump calling him temperamentally unfit to be commander in chief, did anything surprise you about President elect Trump when you met with him in your office? And also, I want to know does anything concern you about a Trump presidency? Well, um, we had a very uh, cordial conversation, and uh, that didn't surprise me to some degree uh, because I think that he is obviously a gregarious person. He's somebody who uh, I think likes to mix it up uh, and to, to uh, have a, a vigorous debate. Um, and uh, you know, what's clear is that he was able to tap into Yes, the anxieties, but also the enthusiasm of his voters uh, uh, in a way that uh, that was impressive, and and I said so to him uh, because I think that uh, to the extent that there were a lot of uh, folks who missed the Trump phenomenon, I think that connection that he was able to make with his supporters. That was impervious to events that might have sunk another candidate. Uh, that's powerful stuff. Um, I also think that he is coming to this office uh, with fewer set, hard and fast policy prescriptions than a lot of other presidents might uh, be arriving with. Uh, I don't think he is ideological. I think ultimately is he's pragmatic in that way, uh, and uh, that can serve him well uh, as long as he's got good people around him and he has a, a clear sense of direction. Um, do I have concerns? Absolutely. Of course I've got concerns. You know, he and I uh, differ on a whole bunch of issues. Um, but. You know, the federal government and our democracy uh, is not a speedboat. It's an ocean liner, as I discovered when I came into office. It took a lot of really hard work for us to make significant policy changes, even in our first two years when we had uh, larger majorities than Mr. Trump will enjoy when he comes into office. And uh, you know, one of the things I advised him to do was to make sure that before he commits to certain courses of action, he's really dug in and thought through um, how various issues play themselves out. I, I'll, I'll use uh, a obvious example uh, where we have a difference, but it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in the coming year, and that's the Affordable Care Act. So obviously this has been uh, the holy grail for Republicans over the last six, seven years was we got to kill Obamacare. Now, uh, that has been taken as an article of faith, that this is terrible, it doesn't work, and we have to undo it. But now <laughs> that Republicans are in charge, they got to take a look and say, let's see, we got 20 million people who have health insurance who didn't have it before. Healthcare costs generally have gone up at a significantly slower rate since Obamacare was passed than they did before, which has saved the federal treasury hundreds of billions of dollars. People who have health insurance are benefiting in all sorts of ways that they may not be aware of, everything from no longer having lifetime limits on uh, the claims that they can make to seniors getting prescription drug discounts uh, under Medicare, 
uh, to free mammograms. Now, it's one thing to characterize these, this thing as not working when it's just an abstraction. Now, suddenly, you're in charge and you're going to repeal it. Okay, well, what happens to those 20 million people who have health insurance? Are you going to just kick them off and suddenly they don't have health insurance? And in, in what ways are their lives better because of that? Are you going to repeal the provision that ensures that if you do have health insurance on your job and you lose your job or you change jobs or you start a small business that you're not discriminating against because you got a pre-existing condition, that's really popular. How are you going to replace it? Um, are you going to change the policy that kids can stay on their parents' health insurance plan until they're 26? Uh, how are you going to approach all these issues? Now. My view is that if they can come up with something better that actually works and a year or two after they've replaced the Affordable Care Act with their own plan, that 25 million people have health insurance and it's cheaper and better and running smoothly, I'll be the first ones to say, that's great, congratulations. If, on the other hand, whatever they're proposing results in millions of people losing coverage and results in people who already have health insurance losing protections that uh, were contained in the legislation, then we're going to have a problem. Uh, and I think that's not going to be unique uh, to me. I think the American people will respond that way. Um, so. I think on a lot of issues, what you're going to see is now comes the hard part. Now is governance. We are going to be able to present to the incoming administration uh, a country that is stronger, a federal government that is working better and more efficiently, uh, a national security apparatus that is both more effective and truer to our values, energy policies that are uh, resulting in not just less pollution, but also more jobs. And um, I think the, the President-elect, rightly, would expect that he's judged on whether we improve from that baseline and on those metrics, or things get worse. And if things get worse, then the American people will figure that out pretty quick. And if things get better, then more power to them. And, and I'll be the first to congratulate them. Mr. Mr. President, you had talked specifically about his temperament. Mm -hmm. Do you still have any concern about his temperament? As I said, because Athena asked the question, um, whatever you bring to this office, uh, this office has a, uh, a habit of uh, magnifying and pointing out, and hopefully then you correct for it. Uh, this may seem like a silly example, but I know myself well enough to know I can't keep track of paper. I am not well organized in that way. And so pretty quickly, after I'm getting stacks of briefing books coming in every night, I say to myself, I've got to figure out a system because uh, I have bad filing, sorting, and organizing habits. And I've got to find some people who can help me keep track of this stuff. Now, that, that seems trivial, but actually it ends up being uh, a pretty big piece of business. I think what will happen with the president-elect is there are going to be certain elements of his temperament that will not serve him well unless he recognizes them and corrects them. Because um, when you're a candidate and you say something that is inaccurate or uh, controversial, it has less impact than it does when you're President of the United States. Uh, everybody around the world is paying attention. Markets move. Uh, national security 
uh, issues uh, require a level of precision in order to make sure that you don't make mistakes. Uh, and I think he's, he recognizes that um, this is different, uh, and so do the American people. All right, I'm going to take just a couple more questions and I get out of here. Uh, Nadia Bobasi. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, President elect Trump threatened to unravel um, the Iran nuclear deal, which your administration worked very hard to achieve. Uh, what would you concern uh, if he alters part of it? And what would you advise me, considering that he said he's open to your advice? And on Syria, sir, um, the Syrian regime now is threatening Aleppo with massive onslaught. You talked passionately a few years back about Benghazi, and you uh, warned against the uh, killing of civilians there. Many people criticize your administration for the shortcoming of the Syria policy. Um, are you willing to let Aleppo fall under your watch? And um, how do you act to President Trump, uh, I mean, President Trump's statement that um, you won't support the Syrian opposition anymore? Thank you. Uh, Iran is a good example of the, the gap, I think, between some of the rhetoric in this town, not unique to the president-elect, and the reality. Um, I think there was a really robust debate about the merits of the Iran deal before uh, it was completed. Uh, and I actually was pretty proud of how our democracy processed that. It was a serious debate. I think people of goodwill were on both sides of the issue. Uh, ultimately, we were able to persuade members of Congress and the public, uh, at least enough of them, to support it. At the time, the main argument against it was Iran wouldn't abide by the deal, that they would cheat. We now have over a year of evidence that they have abided by the agreement. That's not just my opinion. It's not just people in my administration. That's the opinion of Israeli military and intelligence officers uh, who are part of a government that vehemently opposed the deal. So uh, my suspicion is, is that when the president-elect comes in and he's consulting with his Republican colleagues on the Hill, that they will look at the facts. Because to unravel a deal that's working and preventing Iran from pursuing a nuclear weapon uh, would be hard to explain, particularly if the alternative were to uh, have them freed from any obligations and go ahead and pursue a weapon. And keep in mind, this is not just an international agreement between us and the Iranians. This is between the P5 plus one, other countries, some of our closest allies. Uh, and you know, for us to pull out would then require us to start sanctioning those other countries in Europe or China or Russia that were still abiding by the deal because from their perspective uh, Iran had done what it was supposed to do. So it becomes more difficult, I think, to undo something that's working than undo something that isn't working. Uh, and um, when you're not responsible for it, I think you can uh, call it a terrible deal. When you are responsible for the deal and preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, uh, you're more likely to look at the facts. That is going to be true uh, in other circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, the Paris Agreement. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the possibility of undoing uh, this international agreement. Now, you've got 200 countries that have signed up for this thing. And the good news is that what we've been able to show over the last five, six, eight years is that it's possible to grow the economy really fast and possible to bring down carbon emissions as well. It's not just a bunch of rules that we've set up. You've got utilities that 
are putting in solar panels and creating jobs. You've got the big three automakers who have seen record sales and are overachieving on the uh, fuel efficiency standards that we set. Turns out that people like not having to fill up as often and, and save money at the pump, even if it's good for the environment. You've got states like California that have been moving forward on uh, a clean energy agenda, separate and apart from any federal regulations that have been put forward. In fact, 40 percent of the country already lives under, uh, in states that are actively pursuing what's embodied in the Paris Agreement and the Clean Power Plant Rule. And even states like Texas that you know, politically tend to oppose me, you've, you've seen huge increases in wind power and solar power. And you've got some of the country's biggest companies like Google and Walmart all pursuing energy efficiency because it's good for their bottom line. So what we've been able to do is to embed a lot of these practices into how our economy works. And it's made our economy more efficient. It's helped the bottom line of folks. And it's cleaned up the environment. What the Paris Agreement now does is say to China and India and other c countries that are potentially polluting, come on board. Let's work together so you guys do the same thing. And the biggest threat when it comes to climate change and pollution isn't going to come from us because we only have 300 million people. It's going to come from China with over a billion people and India with over a billion people. And if they are pursuing the same kind of the strategies that we did before we became more uh, aware of the environment, then our kids will be choked off. And, and so again, uh, do I think that the new administration will make some changes? Absolutely. But these international agreements, the tradition has been that you carry them forward across administrations, uh, particularly if once you actually examine them, it turns out that they're doing good for us uh, and binding other countries into behavior that will help us. All right, last question. Uh, Justin Sink. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you're right. I, you are right about that. Um, with respect to Syria, uh, in Benghazi, we had an international mandate. We had a UN security resolution. We had a broad-based coalition, and we were able to carry out a support mission uh, that achieved the initial goal of preventing Benghazi from being slaughtered fairly quickly. It's no secret, you know this region well, that Syria is a much more messy situation uh, with proxies coming from every direction. And so I wish that I could bring this to a halt immediately. We have made uh, every effort to try to bring about a uh, political resolution to this challenge. John Kerry has spent uh, an infinite amount of time uh, trying to negotiate with Russians and Iranians and uh, Gulf states and other parties to try to end the killing there. Um, but if what you're asking is, do we have the capacity to carry out the same kinds of military actions in Syria that we did in Libya, the situation is obviously different. We don't have that option easily available to us. Uh, and so we're going to have to continue to try to pursue, as best we can, uh, a political solution and in the interim put as much pressure as we can to the parties to arrive at humanitarian safe spaces and ceasefires that at least allevi alleviate the suffering that's on the ground. I recognize that that has not worked. Uh, and uh, it is something that I continue to think about every day. And we continue to try to find some formula that would allow us to see that suffering end. But I think it, it's not uh, uh, 
surprising to you because you study this deeply that uh, if you have a Syrian military that is committed to killing its people indiscriminately as necessary and it is supported by Russia that now has substantial military assets on the ground and are actively supporting that regime and Iran actively supporting that regime uh, and we are supporting what has to be our number one national security priority which is going after ISIL both in Mosul and ultimately in Raqqa uh, that uh, the situation is not uh, the same as it was in Libya. And obviously there are some who questioned the steps we took in Libya. I continue to believe that was the right thing to do. Although, as I indicated before, um, in the aftermath of that campaign, uh, I think the world community did not sufficiently support the need for some sort of security structures there. And it uh, now is uh, a situation that we have to get back into uh, a better place. Um, I've, I've given you, uh, okay. Uh, last question is uh, Justin Sink at Bloomberg. Thanks, Mr. President. I uh, wanted to ask about two things that might be on your desk over the next couple months yeah. as you prepare for a Trump administration. Um, one is at least three quarters of a million undocumented immigrants provided the federal government information about themselves and their family as part of your Deferred Action Program. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything you can do to either reassure them or shield that information from the uh, the incoming Trump administration, considering his his stance on immigration. And the second is, the administration and you have long maintained that the legal res restraints put on you by Congress governing um, the movement of detainees from Gitmo are un an unconstitutional infringement on your rights as commander-in-chief, uh, considering that the gradual transfers that you've pursued are unlikely to continue under a Trump administration. Is this now the time to sort of test that theory by moving to detainees? the detainees and seeing where the chips are Those are both excellent questions. Um, on the deferred action program that we have, known as DACA, that relates to DREAMers who are currently benefiting from uh, these provisions, uh, I will urge uh, the President-elect and the incoming administration uh, to uh, think long and hard before they are um, endangering the status of what, for all practical purposes, are American kids. Uh, I mean, these are kids who were brought here by their parents. They did nothing wrong. They've gone to school. They have pledged allegiance to the flag. Some of them have joined the military. They've enrolled in school. By definition, if they're part of this program, uh, they are solid, uh, wonderful young people of good character. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it is my strong belief that the majority of the American people would not want to see uh, suddenly those kids have to start hiding again. And uh, that's something that uh, I will uh, encourage uh, the President-elect to look at. Um, with respect to uh, Guantanamo, it is true that I have not been able to close the darn thing because of the congressional restrictions that have been placed on us. What is also true is we have greatly reduced the population. You now have significantly less than 100 people there. Uh, there are some additional transfers that may be taking place over the next two months. Uh, there is a group of very dangerous people that we have strong evidence of having been guilty of committing terrorist acts against the United States, but because of the nature of the evidence, uh, in some cases uh, that evidence being compromised, it's very difficult to put them before a typical Article III court. 
Uh, and that group has always been the biggest challenge for us. My strong belief and preference is that we would be much better off closing Gitmo, moving them to a different facility that was clearly governed by U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, we'd do it a lot cheaper uh, and uh, just as safely. Congress disagrees with me, uh, and I gather that the President-elect does as well. Uh, we will continue to explore options uh, for doing that. Uh, but keep in mind that it's not just a matter of what I'm willing to do. Uh, you know, one of the things you discover about being president is uh, that uh, there are all these rules and norms and laws, and you got to pay attention to them. Uh, and the people who work for you are also subject to those rules and norms. Uh, and that's a piece of advice that I gave to um, to the incoming president. Um, I am very proud of the fact that uh, we will, knock on wood, lead this administration without significant scandal. We've made mistakes, there have been screw-ups, but I will put the ethics of this administration and our track record in terms of just abiding by uh, the rules and norms and keeping trust with the American people, I will put this administration against any administration in history. And the reason is because, frankly, we listened to the lawyers. You know, we had a strong White House Counsel's Office. We had a strong ethics office. We had uh, people in every agency who, whose job it was to remind people this is how you're supposed to do things. It doesn't mean everybody always did everything exactly the way it's supposed to because we got two million people uh, working in the federal government, if, you know, if you're including the military. And so we had to uh, just try to institutionalize this as much as we could, and that takes a lot of work. And one of my uh, suggestions to the incoming president is, is that he take that part of the job seriously as well. Uh, again, you wouldn't know this if you were listening to some news outlets. Uh, or some uh, members of oversight committees in Congress. But if you actually look at the facts, it works. Um, and this is just one example of the, the numerous ways in which the federal government is much better today than it was without people really knowing. You look at VA, people remember the legitimate problems that were uh, publicized in Phoenix. It was scandalous what happened. Um, what people don't remember is, is that we've brought in uh, well over a million people who are getting benefits that weren't getting it before, driven the um, backlog for disability benefits way down, cut homelessness in half, just made the agency work better. Not work perfect, but work better. Uh, and one of the mottos I always have with my staff was, better is good. Yeah, perfect is unattainable, better is possible. And so uh, we will try to share the lessons uh, that we've learned over these last eight years with the incoming president. And my hope is he makes things better. Um, and if he does, we'll all benefit from him. All right? Thank you, everybody. 